Um, so the second lecture of this morning will be given by Professor Yin Chi Chen. Um, that's the explanation and refresh. Okay, thanks for the for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about that's the explanation and regression. So first I will talk about that's the explanation and the later part we'll, we are going to cover some regression method. So that's the explanation. So like the idea of that's the explanation is that say, we have observed our data, so here we just achieved one dimensional, so it's a univariate problem, but of course it can be a case by using multivariate case. We observe our data x1 to xn, and remember that in statistical model, we model them as random variables. So we have these random variables, random variables x1, xn, they are from some unknown distribution function, so capital Px. And we further assume that this distribution function has a probability density function, or we just abbreviated, say, PDF, probability density function, little Px. And the goal is that in most cases we don't know the density function. Because if we know that, it means that we know the and basically we know most of it. Almost all the information about the population, and that's not the, the real case. In practice, we only observe the data, and this guy, the distribution function, and this guy, the density function, they are both unknown to us. And we want to use the data to infer this guy, the density function, or the distribution function. And here we will focus on inferring the probability density function. So, in other words, the parameter of interest, if you remember in yesterday we talked about like the parameters of the parameter of interest. In this case, the parameter of interest is the PDF, is the probability density function. So you can see that now thing, the problem gets a little bit more complicated compared to like estimating just a single number. Because we are now estimating an entire function. So you know, this guy is a function, so it's not that easy to estimate. So a simple approach is that, well, let's just assume that the density function can be written in terms of some other parameter. So we would say we are using a, in this case, we would say that we are using a parameter model. So we assume that the density function Px, equal to Px and comma theta. Just like what we have talked about yesterday, so like assume that it's a normal distribution, but just now we don't know the mean and the variance parameter. So that then in this case, if we assume that the density function can be written as a parametric form, like this guy, then estimating the density function becomes just estimating the parameter. So how we are going to do is that, like, how we can do, how we can kind of, in this case, how we estimate the density function just become estimating the parameter. So then we can use methods like the MLE to estimate it. So here's an example, like, if we assume that the density function is normally distributed, so it's some normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance sigma squared. And now the mean and the sigma, like, and the variance, they are unknown to us. So all we need to do is to estimate these two parameters, and then we just plug in to the PDF form of the normal distribution, then we get our density estimate. So like in the case of MLE, remember, in the MLE, the mean parameter can be estimated just using the sample mean, and this is the MLE for the variance parameter. So then the estimated density function is just this guy. Remember, this is just a form of the normal distribution, but now I replace sigma squared by the MLE, and I replace the mu, the mean parameters by the MLE as well. And actually, MLE is not the only way to estimate the parameter model. It's just a method, it's not the method. So you can use some other method, like the method of moments. If you are interested, in, you can search this. This parameter of moments is another approach you, that you, people commonly use to estimate parameters. So as long as you can estimate parameters, and if you are using a parameter model, then you can estimate the density function quite easily. So that's the simple idea. So if we assume the parameter model. However, this parameter model, like a Gaussian, assuming it's a Gaussian distribution, or assuming that it's an exponential distribution, or assuming it's a gamma function or gamma distribution, these assumptions sometimes are very strong. They cannot capture some complicated structures. Say, for instance, if a, if a distribution we, we found that the distribution has bimodal, it's is bimodal, so it has two local maximum. Then in this case, none of these distributions are reasonable because the Gaussian only has one peak, exponential is decaying, and the gamma distribution also has one peak. So then if it's bimodal, then none of these methods works. So to solve this problem and to keep using the parameter model, people, will, people propose a method called the mixture model. So the mixture model is very easy. 
So the idea is that we assume that this function, the PDL, can be written as a mixture of different parametric model, parametric density function. So here's one case, the Gaussian mixture model. So some of you might have heard, heard about it or might have you been using that. So in the Gaussian mixture model, the probability density function can be written as like omega 1, a number times, here's a Gaussian, and it's a mean mu 1 and variance is sigma 1 squared and plus blah blah plus wk. And so basically in this case, we will say that it's a k Gaussian mixture model. So we have k different Gaussians in this first Gaussian and there's a second, third, blah blah, blah up to the k Gaussian. And the omega here is, there's a requirement that omega is greater than zero and summation of all these omega will be one. So the omega here is the proportion of each Gaussian component. So in this case, it's called Gaussian mixture model. So you can see that the density now becomes the mixture of different Gaussian. And this quantity, like people call it like a missing com proportion or the component of like the, the ratio of each component. So in this case, the parameters, there are many parameters. Each, need, each, compo each this proportion is a parameter, and each sigma, sigma square and each mu is also a parameter. So here, in the K Gaussian mixture model, there are roughly 3K parameter, and actually there's only 3K minus 1. You can think about why. And the reason is that there's one constraint here. So although the omega there seems to be K omega, but actually there's only K minus 1 degree of freedom. So in this case, it's 3K minus 1 parameter. So as long as we can estimate all these numbers, then we can see the Gaussian mixture model. So that's the idea of Gaussian mixture. And of course, how we can estimate that? Well, we can use the MLE again. But there's a caveat. Using MLE in the mixture model open is computational difficult. And this ML, in this case, open the MLE does not have a closed form solution. So you have to use some numerical methods like gradient descent or gradient, gradient descent method or Newton, Newtonian method. And sometimes things that we use a method called EM algorithm to compute the MLE. But the problem is that the EM algorithm is not guaranteed to it always come. It, it always comes, it always converges to the local mean, lo local optimum. So it's not guaranteed that it converges to the real MLE. It converges to some locally best parameter, but it's not guaranteed it converges to the real global best parameter. So that's the problem. And so, and in addition to this computational choice, so this is in the EM algorithm, what people will do is that they will just pick an initial configuration, run the algorithm, find the optimal, and then randomly choose another configuration, like initial point, initial get like initial value of the parameter, run the algorithm again, and then every time they break record, they record it with the the estimated parameters and likelihood value of the likelihood function. So after repeating this multiple times, you just pick the one that's the best among all of them. But still this does not guarantee you to find the optimal, the real optimal. So that's always a problem of this like computational challenges. And in addition to these computational challenges, there is another problem which is called the identifiability. So the identifiability means that sometimes the same distribution function can be written as two. You know, you, you have multiple ways to write the same probability density function in the mixture model. So in that case, then you know it's difficult to say why is the which way is the real, real, like real configuration or real way to write write out the density function. It's like a different parameters, but they all have similar distribution. The, the distribution looks very similar. Then it's very difficult to distinguish them. So that's another problem called identifiability, and that's very tough. So although mixture model is great and it's easy to interpret because like Gaussian mixture, if you have three Gaussian mixture, then you know like it seems that they you can interpret that as like the distribution or the population has three different components. So you may some people would like I know in biology sometimes people would say that it means that it implies that the population has three different subpopulations. So if you use the mixture model, then people can always use this subpopulation way to interpret the data or interpret the density function. But the problem then we know that although it is this nice interpretation and just estimating the parameter, you can estimate everything. But the problem is computation and identifiability. So there's always the pros and cons. But that's the mixture model. And and so by the way, so any questions? So it's a classical method to ask for, yes. Do you have an example of the mixture model? I mean, like a mixture model? Uh, like you can use the Gaussian mixture is an example. 
So you can have like two, if you have one bimodal distribution mentor, we'll just assume that they are two Gaussian mixture, and then you can just estimate that by using MLE. So that's a kind of a common example. Like if you observe your data have a like bimodal distribution mentor, we'll just assume a Gaussian mixture. Okay, so that's the mixture model. So it actually, when we found that the, test, the, like the distribution of the data are kind of complicated, in many cases, we will just use a so-called non-perch method. So non-perch non method means that we do not make any parametric assumption. So we do not assume it's, it can be written as a parametric form. And we directly we want to directly use the original data to estimate a PDF. And so this non-perch method, they are, you know, we don't have, we don't, we do not make these parametric form assumptions. So it's a very powerful method because we do not make such a restrictive assumption. And actually, many, many of you have already seen one, one non perch method, which is the histogram. So in the histogram, if you remember, in the histogram, basically we do not assume that it's a Gaussian, we do not make any assumption on like the distribution look like certain parameter form. We directly use the observed data or just being the range, right? We being the range, and they just make a count for each of them. So like, made a count at each thing so that we can kind of get a shape of the distribution. So actually, the histogram is a, cla a, like a classical method in number estimation. So it's a way, it's a method to estimate a probability density function. But there's a caveat when you are using a histogram as a density estimator. Because if you remember in a histogram, the y-axis we always use the frequency, which means that we just use the count, like a counting number of observations in each mean. But if we want to convert this guy into a probability density function, the requirement for a probability density function is that its integration is one. If you are using a count, then the integration will not be one. The integration actually turns out that it will be the dense times the total sample, the sample size. So you have to rescale the y-axis a little bit. So actually what you are going to do is that I'm just using the same histogram, but I'm going to divide the y-axis by sample size times the dense of the bin. And it turns out that this guy will give you, if you take the integration of them, then you will find that this gives you, this integration will be one, so it's a valid density function. So in the histogram, histogram is a traditional way, a classical way to do this density estimation, but just remember you have to, you have to do a little bit of rescaling on the y-axis. But at least the shape will be correct. So to typically say this, we will say that we use the histogram like the beam, the width of the beam is L. And then we just count the number and take the divided the rescale of y-axis so we get a density estimate. So this part is a simple approach, right? Actually, in many cases, it's a very powerful tool. And so now if we say, okay, we, we are going to use the histogram to estimate a density function. So that's the kind of an intuitive question is that, well, is a histogram a good density estimator? Well, it depends on the curve. It depends, it depends on the situation and, and, assum and the assumptions. And actually, we can study the performance of the histogram as a density estimator by using the mean square error. So just remember, so now if I, put, I fix a point x, the quality of the histogram, the density estimated based on the histogram, this guy is a density estimator of the original density function, px. So this p hat hist is a histogram density estimator. It's an estimator for the true density function px. So, if, just if you remember yesterday, we have talked about that how we measure the a simple way to measure the quality of the estimator or when we are using the mean, mean square error is the bias and the variance. And it turns out that when the bin, the size of the bin is close, is very small, and the sample size is large, the bias of the histogram estimator is at the old like it's at the order of L, which means that when L is shrinking to zero, then the bias is depends on the beam, the size of the beam. And the variance of our histogram estimator is actually at the order of one over n times L. So this gives you an interesting result. Because it means that the bias basically is independent of your sample size. It's completely determined by the beam, or at least the leading term is determined by the width of the width of the beam. But then it makes sense because you know when you are using a large beam, then it means that, well, you, if you are using a large beam, then when you are doing use as a histogram estimator, then we are going to kind of you cannot capture the tiny structure, right? 
when you when the beam size is a lot, then a lot then that's the random fluctuate that's the inside there you just take it somewhat like using a beam to represent the entire region. So you can see like when the beam size L is a lot, the bias is a lot. So this guy makes sense. In terms of the stochastic variation, why the beam size is in the denom denominator? Well you can just view that when the beam size is small, then the number of observations inside this beam is small, right? So when the beam size is small, then you can see because the, well, you, are, you are taking only a few the average of a few points, so the stochastic variation will be large. So that's why it's 1 over n times L. So that's the intuition about the result. This is right. So when the beam, when the beam is large, we are kind of suffering a lot from the bias. But the variance is small. But when the beam size is small, we are suffering a lot of, from the stochastic variation, the variance. But the bias is small. And so the mean square error, when we take both into account, it can be written as this at the order of L squared plus at the order of 1 over NL. That's the mean square error. So, this guy, the bias variance, is the bias variance trade off we have known, and that's what we have described. When the L is small, the bias is small, but the variance is large. When the L is large, bias is large, but the variance is small. So this tells, and so sometimes people will call this a bias variance trade off. This is when you are choosing, the, when you have changed the value of L, when the L is large, then the bias is large, but the variance is small. When L is very small, variance is large, but the bias is small. So you are kind of, ideally, we want to choose the L and optimize this bias and variance. So it turns out that, you know, solving this guy, like when we pick L, the width at the order of n to the 1 minus third. One third. Then this guy will will give us at least in terms of the convergence rate, he will give us the optimal his, his graph, also his graph estimator. So using this, at least of course I write this no, notation means that there's some constant times this guy. So this, when you choose a bin with us, this guy, then it gives at least in terms of the mean square error, it gives you the best at best histogram among the all possible histogram histogram you can construct. So then the optimal mean square error will be at the rate of this guy. So this tells you that when I have more and more sample size, then I should choose a bin, I can have a bin with, I should decrease the bin width. Because now I have more strong evidence, then I can count, I can shrink both the bias and the variance. That's how you choose the piece, the bin, how the bin width will affect the quality of estimation. So later you will see that in many non quality estimators, we always have at least a parameter we call it tuning parameter. This parameter will determine the quality of our estimation, and we can always use some theoretical analysis to at least understand what when the sample when we get more and more sample, how should we choose this per Turing parameter, or how should this Turing parameter shrink towards zero? Because always this Turing parameter will affect the bias and error trade-off. That's for the histogram. So any questions? Okay, so. The histogram, now we learn simple method of histogram. So here's another approach called, and it's actually more common in statistics. And then you will see that this method is, this density estimator is better than histogram in, in some of some, in many cases. So this, we are going to introduce another method called the kernel density estimator, or kernel density estimation. Or we just open say KDE. So the KDE estimator density using this form, he had KD at the point x is one over n h and summation of his blah blah blah. This this guy. So this k is a function called a k kernel function. You can just view it as like a Gaussian function. And h here is a quantity called a smoothing bandwidth. So the idea of KD is actually yeah, common choice of a kernel function like a Gaussian or sometimes people just use a uniform kernel. So this kernel basically the idea of the KD is illustrated as this picture. So now we have six, say these six black bars are the location of the observation. So what KDE do is that now I smooth out each data point. So originally I, the data point is just, just one value, right? So now I smooth it out by the kernel function, so I get a lot of these small purple bounds. So each of them are like a, a small bound, and the shape of this small bound is determined by the kernel function. And then the final density estimator is like sum over all these small bounds then we will get a kind of a density estimate. So it's like, I, if I have a lot, of, I just have a collection of points, then every point I just smooth it out by 
a small bubble determined by the kernel function. Then I just take sum over all of them so I can get the density estimate. So that's the idea of the kernel density estimate. So for the points that there are a lot of observations around, then you see that a lot, it will just, it will, there will be a lot of small bites around. So if I use sum over all of them, that part of the density function will be large. And for regions, there's only a few observations, then you know, there are ti this tiny bound will be very, only a few tiny bounds there. So the density there will also be small. So that's the idea of the kernel density estimate. So it's just like, I have a bunch of points, I just smooth them out, and then take the average of all of them. So here, the smooth edge, the smoothing phantoms, this quantity determines the width of this bar. So you know, if the edge is small, then I'm kind of only smoothing to like a local region. If edge is large, I'm smoothing to a kind of wider region. And some, here are some common choice of the kernel function. Like this is so-called uniform kernel. It's just like kernel function is like this box. So here, the center is zero, so it's like when it's right inside the radius of the edge. Then I give the equal weight outside the edge, then I give basically nothing. And this, this another function, kernel function, sometimes you will see people use it. It's called a epanergical kernel. It turns out that this kernel function, although it's very difficult to pronounce its name, but this kernel function has a lot of mathematical optimalities. So it's a very interesting fact. And these guys, in many cases, people will just use this guy, the Gaussian kernel. This Gaussian kernel is smooth, infinite, differentiable, and it has a lot of beautiful properties. And even I remember, if I remember correctly, this is even somebody tried to associate this kernel as estimated using Gaussian kernel to like a heat, equa heat equation. Anyway, so this is like a different kernel function, and this is like a bimodal distribution. Now, this is a corresponding estimated density function. So you can see that. No, although in a uniform kernel, we will see a more wiggle structure, but the main feature is basically the same among all of them. So by kernel function, you can see like, well, it does, although it, it does affect some like a time, like the local structure, but the global structure, like the main is too big, it will, the, the kernel function will not affect it too much. And it turns out that in, in the theory, the kernel function does not affect too much about the theoretical results. Later we will see. But the smoothing bandwidth will play a key role in the estimation. So here's a picture about the same data. I'm now using three different smoothing bandwidths. H is one, which is this green line. You can see now I have more bounds. H is three, which is this blue curve. And H is smoothing bandwidth V10. So here you can see like now if the smoothing bandwidth is too large, at first I have two distinct modes, but now it's kind of smooth out by the smoothing bandwidth. So you have to be careful if the smoothing bandwidth is too large, then it's going to smooth out some features. And of course, this, how the smoothing bandwidth affect the results, actually we can also view that from the mean square error and the bias variance trade-off. It turns out that the bias of the kernel density estimator is at the order of all edge squared. This is when edge is very small and when the simple size is large, and the variance is similar to the histogram at the order of one over n edge. So it means that the mean square error of the kernel density estimator has these two components, O h to the power of four plus O one over n h. So it's simply just you can just it's, you can see that in this case, the optimal choice of h is like h is at the rate of n to the one minus one over one six, leading to the optimal convergence rate, which is this guy. N to the minus four divided by five. This is the optimal convergence rate for kernel density estimator. But of course, there are some other way you can even boost it up to an even higher order, to close to like a one over n. And compared to the histogram, which is at this rate, you will find that at least in terms of the theoretical analysis, this guy converts to zero faster than this guy. Which means that at least in as impactfully, kernel density estimator is a better density estimate compared to the histogram. So that's a, like a kind of an important feature of that. And here I'm going to use the, something to show illustrate the bias and the variance trade-off. We are, so this is using, oh, uh, there's an R has this powerful function called R shining. You can use this live demonstration of some result. So here's a, here's a picture about estimating the density function of a Gaussian distribution. So the blue curve is a theoretical density function of the Gaussian. And the red curve is the estimated, like estimated density function using the kernel density estimate. 
the S nine index doctor. And the reason why you can still see the rate curve fluctuating is because every one second I will draw a new sample from the, the same Gaussian distribution. And every one second I draw a new sample, I estimate the disk function. So that's why every once, every one second you like it will ch keep changing because every time I'm drawing a new sample from a same distribution, but because every time I'm getting a different sample, so the estimated disk function will be a different will be a different density curve. So here you can see now if I change the smoothing value to be very small, you can see now it's getting a more random fluctuation around the blue curve, right? Although it gets more random fluctuation, but at least it's centered at the blue curve. So here that's, this means that the variation is large, so the variance is large, but it's centered at the blue curve, so it implies that the bias is small. On the other hand, if now I increase the smoothing bandwidth, here you can see it's the red curve is almost not changing. It's very, very stable. So it means that when the smoothing bandwidth is large, the variance, the variance is very small. But now you can see we are suffering from a problem that the red curve is systematically biased from the blue curve. So that means that in this case, the bias is very huge. So now you can see like random for edge, how the edge will affect the result in your bias and variance trade off. For edge is small, we see more random fluctuation. For edge is large, we see more. For edge is large, then the random fluctuation is very tiny, but the, our estimate is systematically biased from our target. And actually, here's the result. Here I'm using the sample size of the 500, but now if I change the sample size to like 5,000, you can see now the result gets much, much better. So even I'm using the same very small smoothing bandwidth, but now you can see, although it also has some wiggle structure, but at least it's kind of the fluctuation decrease a lot. So now you see that the sample size, how the sample size affect the variance, the variance of your estimator. But on the other hand, if now I'm using a very large smoothing bandwidth like this guy, it's almost not changing, and if I change the sample size, you can see that the bias does not change. The bias is Generally, it's independent of the sample size. In, it is in the curve that's estimator. So now you can see, like, when I have more sample size, I should choose a smaller, smaller smoothing bandwidth in order to trade off the bias and the variance. That's the idea. And so now, when you are thinking about when we are thinking about the variance of the estimator, just remember, it's like a fluctu random fluctuation when we keep generating from it, keep sampling from a stem distribution. The variance is describing this stochastic variation, and the bias is describing this systematic bias from the theoretical result, or like the, the target. So that's the bias variance trade-off. Any questions? Observing a new observation inside the ball centered at point X 
with the radius of this guy. It's roughly this, this ratio. You can just think about like because of the true probability density function will integrate to one. So this ratio, k divided by n, is roughly this guy. But the k is very small. And for example, that's graph here. And this probability is approximately, you know, when the radius is small, it's roughly just this, like the volume of this ball, volume of the b dimensional ball. So here, b is the dimension of the data, b dimensional ball with this radius times the density at that point. So using this approximation, then you know, we can estimate the density as k divided by n divided by uh, times 1 over c, this constant, times this rk to the power of p. So it's just using this feature, just using inverting this guy as a way to estimate the density function. So as long as you know the location from, let's say, for point x, as long as you know the distance to its k near, nearest neighbor, then I can invert that. I can invert that distance to get a density estimate. So now that's how we can get that. So here, k is some just number we know we, because we pick it, and it's a sample size. db is the size of the d-dimensional unit ball. So it's something you can, you can even check the Wikipedia. There's a table for that. And rk is the, the number that we compute. So we can simply estimate the density function. That's the Kenyan k and then this estimator. So in here, like some cases, but the b is one, then the one-dimensional ball, this constant unit ball is just a length of, length of the unit, like a, like a unit ball in the one-dimensional case. So this cd will be a two, because the size of that will be two r, if the radius is r. So in the one-dimensional case, the size is two r. When the b is two, then this cd a constant will be pi, because the size of the two-dimensional ball is pi r squared, if you remember. And in the case of b equals three, then we know that the constant will be 4 over 3 times pi, because it's 4 over 3 pi r to the cube. So using that, then we can always estimate, here's our corresponding density estimator in each different dimension. So again, in this case, you can do the computation, and it turns out that they also have a bias variant trade off. And in the case of b equals 1, the mean square error of the Kenyan's neighbor density estimator has this bias term, this bias is this guy, and the variance is of this, of this ratio. So in a sense, you can roughly kind of see, well, how this number k, actually in this case, the k behave just like the row of the edge, smoothing back with edge in the kernel density estimator, or like the size of the bin in the piece of So they are all so-called Turing parameter. So you can roughly see why the variance is of this guy. This is why you are using the k nearest, k nearest points. Then you are only using k point to somewhat like using k point to estimate like taking the average, somewhat like taking the average. So if you remember the taking the average, the, the variance of your estimate is always like a one over the size, sample size. So that's why it's one over k. It is a leading term is at that order. And the bias is more complicated, but you can see like it's depending on the ratio of observation inside this region. So as long as this ratio is shrinking to zero, then you know that you are kind of, you are, the bias is small. So then again, the mean square error of the Kenyan, Kenyan is estimated, like KNN estimated is this guy. And this quantity, if you solve, try to find the optimal K, it turns out that it has the optimal, uh, the optimal convergence rate is the, at the same order as the kernel based estimator. But the Kenyan's neighbor approach, this KNN approach has a very severe drawback, which is that it's not guaranteed that it as many density functions is a real density function, which means some that sometimes when you're taking the integration, the integration might even diverge. It's not guaranteed to be integrated to one. But if in some cases, if you are just trying to find out some points that observation that are among the low density region, if you are just using the ranking of the observation, then it's a very fast way you can compute that. So to see why this guy does not might might not convert to might not might diverge, just consider the dimension in the case of e equals one. Then you will, you will find that when x goes to infinity, that is away from all the observation, this function, the density is decaying as 1 over x. So when you are taking the integration, then it turns out that it will diverge. So the KNN, although it's a nice way, a nice estimator, and easy to compute, but the problem is that it's not guaranteed that it's a real density function. So that's the feature of the KNN's neighbor. So, and here, before we end the density estimation, I want to mention that in density estimation, we can also do statistical 
obviously the legal inference that constructing a commonness band, a commonness, we call it commonness, in this case we will call it commonness band rather than commonness interval. Because now we are having a function, so we want to have a band that covering these functions. And, and there are two, actually there are two approaches, they are, they are two types of a commonness band or a commonness interval. First, one is called a pointwise commonness interval or pointwise commonness band. It means that for a given point x and a given commonness level, we are going to find an interval again, an interval such that the density function and the point x is covered by these two, with the probability like what, roughly one minus alpha. So that's called a pointwise because it's for a given point x. And there's something, there's another guy called a simultaneous commonness band. So for the simultaneous commonness band is that we are trying to find somewhat like a commonness interval, but it's more like a commonness <coughs> region. Because it has the upper bound and the lower bound is the bound up. Both of them are functions. So you can see it depends on x. And the requirement is that the true density function is covered by this upper, upper function and the lower function for every x. It's the probability of that is roughly 1 minus r. So you can see that this requirement is much stronger than this guy. Because this guy, the point was only required for a given point. But this guy is required for every point. So you can see that the simultaneous case is more restrictive. And there are some, uh, many, some approach to do that, and in many cases, people will propose to use the bootstrap method to try to find how, how to find this common sense. It's like you can use the bootstrap method. But I think we don't have the time to cover the details, and here are some pictures about common sense bands. The left hand side, the common sense band by bootstrap, is a, it's a pointwise common sense band. So you can see it's like the width is this side, and on the right hand side, this side, it's a uniform common sense band or a simultaneous common sense band. So you can see like the this. The width of this band is wider than the width of this band. Because if you want to guarantee that simultaneous coverage, then typically you know you have to control more random fluctuation for mm, uniformly for every point. So that's why in the case of uniform or like simultaneous commonness band is always like wider. But the feature of that, that's how we can do like inference for like commonness band, commonness inference for density estimation. So any questions before we move to the regression analysis? Yes. Hi. So in real data, we have uh, we have observational uncertainty for every that point, and the uh, uncertainty can be different for each point. So is there any way to deal with the, the observational uncertainty in this approach? So that's a very good point. So actually, there are some that, that problem is that it is called the convolution problem. So it's like to observe the point, but the, actually what we observe is not the true location. It's like observation is like the original position plus some noise. And now the goal is to find out maybe say the density function of the original like before corrupted, right? So that's called a deconvolution. And there's a kernel method called a deconvolution kernel. So it's a very special kernel function, and it's designed to do this handle this situation. Of course, if there are some assumptions, like you have to know some information about like the how is like how the noise is added to your observation. And it's the magnitude of the noise. You don't have to know the exact value, but you need to know like the no the added noise is like Gaussian or not, or whether it's a exponential distribution or it's a more like contact error terms. If you know, have that kind of information, there are some method called deconvolution kernel. So you can try to search the deconvolution kernel and the convolution problem, and there will be a couple of a lot of statistical literature about that. Uh, in the KN method, if the, the point, the nearest point, already has a um, major uncertainty for intrinsic scattered, how do you deal with that? Is there any existing method already? So if you are, you are saying that I want to estimate the density function, but now, but the, point, the problem is that every point is already corrupted by some extra noise. Right? Yeah, they're not a perfect, in the perfect position in the real uh, distribution. They are perturbed. Right? They're perturbed a little bit, right? So it's, yeah, it's related to the deconvolution problem. So it's like, deconvolution means that it's like, what we observe is the original position plus some noise. So then there's like, the, the method I mentioned is like the deconvolution kernel is a common method, but you, at least you need to know like, how is perturbed, like not the exact value, but it's like a, it's perturbation comes from like a, adding a Gaussian noise or adding some kind of noise. If you know that, then there's a there's a, this convolution kernel that you can apply. And people have proved a couple of theories like under certain condition that you will come to the or you will come back to the original density function. So there are some methods that can do that. But 
you need to assume some assumptions on like the, how it's corrupted, like how this actual noise is coming from. So now let's move on to the next topic, which is the regression. So regression is an approach to study the relationship between two variables, and we would call it x. We write as x and y, and the y variable here is called a response variable. It's always typically the variable. In many cases, it's a variable we want to know its relationship with another guy called the covariate x. And the covariate x, sometimes you will see that I think in machine learning people call it feature. Or sometimes it's, it's also called a predictor or an independent variable. And typically, the, this covariate x, it could be multivariate. It could even be high dimensional. Like it could be like have millions of different entries, and the response is typically one only a, a one dimensional thing. But here we will just assume that it's one dimensional case just for simplicity. But many methods we talk about can be generalized to this multivariate covariate. So in the regression analysis, a traditional way is to summarize this relationship is to use the so-called regression function. So the regression function is i, is a function of x, the function of the value of the covariate. It's the expected value of the response of y. Here, remember the y is a random number, so given x, the covariate being x. So if you write, out, write it down in terms of like this, Conditional test function is just the y, the exact value of y given covariate being little x. So that's a regression function. So the goal of a regression is to try to find out this regression, try to find out this guy using our data. Our data is, in this case, it will be a pair of equation x1, y1, x2, y2, blah, 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 xn, yn. So we want to try to find out this regression function. So a simple approach, and I think most of you, or I think all of you would have heard about is the linear regression. So basically, linear regression is to assume that this regression function can be written as a linear model, beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. So it's a linear linear curve, just a curve. So beta 0 and beta 1, these two parameters completely determine how the regression function looks like. And sometimes, people will make an additional assumption and just rewrite these models of this guy. Yi, each observation can be written as beta 0 plus beta 1 times the covariate plus the noise. The reason why a lot of people prefer this way is that it means that the response behaves like a signal term plus a noise. So here, epsilon i are the noise. So it's, it means that it's a mean 0, given the covariate, it's mean 0, and the variance is like sigma squared. And some people will even further assume that this noise is a Gaussian. But in many cases, actually, we don't need to assume the noise is Gaussian. So this, this, and this model are basically they are almost the same, just a, li a little bit more assumption, but this model is easy to interpret because it's, it means it's like a signal plus noise model. So sometimes you will see people talking about signal plus noise model in statistics, it means like somewhat like this guy. The response becomes like a signal plus a noise. So now, to find out this regression function in a linear regression, then the problem becomes trying to only to find out these two parameters, beta 0 and beta 1. And the beta zero, in many cases, is called the slope, uh, the intercept. This is like the intercept if you plot a graph. And the beta one will be called, it's called a slope, because it's like a slope of, in the xy plane. So the goal is to find out these two, uh, the intercept and the slope. Then, a classical approach is actually invented by Gauss. I think it's invented by Gauss, and when he's trying to fit I think it's fitting some astronomy problem, if I remember correctly, in this method, the least square method. So it means that we are trying to, our estimator, beta 0 half and the beta 1 half, the estimate of the slope and the intercept, intercept and slope, are the like mean. means that I'm trying to find the minimal value of beta 0 and beta 1, such that to minimize this guy, this is called a summation of the, you can see like observed value, and this is like fitting the result, so it's called a least square method. We can just view this yi, and this guy has the observed value of y. This will be somewhat like your predictive value based on your chosen beta 0 and beta 1. This will be the predictive value of yi. So it's like we are trying to find the beta 0 and beta 1 that optimize our predictive square loss, like optimize the predictive square loss. And we can just try to solve this guy, and it turns out that, you know, if you do the partial derivative, it's easy to find out that. The estimator can be written as the least simple way. 
the slope is just like summation of these two two parts and divided by this guy, and the intercept is just this form. Very easy, you can just solve the least square type here, and you will find out that this will be the estimate. So even has a closed form solution. So using the S matrix, okay, L, sometimes we call L S E this were S matrix. You, you can just predict the value of Y as this guy. And I just plug in the S matrix and use the value of covariance. That will be the predictive value of the Y. And then the difference between the predictive value and the observed value in the response is called the procedure, just like this guy. And sometimes people will use this quantity called sum of square procedure or like R, and residual sum of square, RSS, is summation of this residual as a way to summarize the fitting to the data. Because you know if the, this number is small, it means that well, our predictive value basically pass most of the point. So it means that our fitting is quite good. Sometimes people use this, this quantity to summarize the result. And so you can also always, you can also interpret this least square estimate or least square approach as finding the best linear model to minimize this the residual sum of square. If now I have if now I have different predictor, I have different value of beta one, beta zero, so I'm trying to find out the beta one and beta zero pair. Then such that this summation of this guy is minimized. And actually after estimating this guy, after after estimating these two guys, you can just use in the summation of the residual to estimate the noise level. So you can also estimate the noise level. But typically the noise level is not the main parameter we are interested in. We are always often interested in the, the intercept and the slope. So that's the linear relation. And the linear least square estimator has a lot of really nice theoretical properties. <coughs> the first one means that they are unbiased estimator. So the bias of the slope, so the intercept and the slope are zero. And the variance can be written on this guy. The variance even has a cross form. And here as x where it's just a summation of this guy is roughly like the simple standard deviation, the simple variance of the covariance. So actually this guy tells this result tells you an interesting fact, which is that in terms of the slope, if the distribution of the covariance is larger, right, if the distribution of the covariance is larger, then this x x square will be larger, right? So the variance of your slope will be smaller. So you can somehow get the end that kind of intuition because when you have when the all the covariates are very concentrated, then you know that kind of for some reason it cannot fluctuation could be large. It could not may not get a stable result. And when the covariate distribution is distribution of covariate is large, then you kind of you can see that the slope will be more stable. So actually a lot of experimental designs, if in some cases, especially in medical research, you can choose the value of the covariate you want to observe. So then in that case, people will think about how to optimize this SX square to optimize this result. So there's a lot of cool things about that. And by the way, this layers by central limit theorem, actually the least square estimate converges to a normal distribution under some kind of very mild assumption. So using this result and the variance of this guy, you can actually construct a countless interval for each of them. So the standard error, just using this case, this guy, you can find the standard error of the, the intercept and the slope as well. So the countless interval will be just these two quantities. Oh, I think this is one minus alpha divided by five. Anyway, just the concept we have mentioned yesterday. So then you can just use this plus my estimated value plus minus the multiplier times the standard error to count the countless interval. So the good news for linear regression is that you don't even need to run bootstrap or you don't even need to run like a jackknife or any other approach, resampling approach. You can directly use the theoretical analysis to control a countless interval. And actually, this countless interval, if I remember correctly, is more accurate than you're doing the bootstrap. It is in some cases. So that's the good news. You don't even, and like in R, it's automatically when you fit the linear model, you automatically control a countless interval for you. Because there's even closed form solution that you see here. There's even closed form solution to a countless interval. So it's, we don't have to do any of these kind of boost, like resampling methods, so it's really nice. So here's the linear regression. And in the case of like if we have multiple covariates, so then we can generalize the linear regression to like in the previous case we only consider one single covariate x. But now if like for each observation I have a response variable, like say the like a response variable like let me see, like the brightness, 
And now if I have multiple covariate like those, like the brightness of a galaxy, so each observation is a galaxy, I have the brightness of the galaxy, so now the covariate could be um, state, the stellar mass, the age of the galaxy, or like the, some distribution of a certain kind of other properties of the, ga of the galaxy itself. So in that case, we will have one response variable, but multiple covariate. But we can, in that case, we can still fit a linear one. So now, but now in this case, the regression function Rx, this x will be a multivariate, it will be a multivariate variable. So it can be written as beta zero is again a linear model, but it's now a linear in terms of each individual variable. So the linear regression, or sometimes you people call it multiple linear regression, it means that we are fitting a multivariate covariate. So if we let a response variable be a vector, and I define a so-called data matrix like this guy for the covariate. So this means that each, each row is one observation, the value of the covariate for each observation, but now the first element I put the value of one. And then you will see why I put this value of one. So if I construct this data matrix, then this vector, you can just simply write the signal, signal plus noise model of this way. Response equals x beta plus fm. And the beta will be beta zero the slope, beta one, beta two, power plus up, up to beta p. So here p is the dimension of the covariant. So the reason I put one here in the data matrix or the covariant matrix is just that then I can write it in this simple and elegant way to represent the signal plus noise model. So then you can just write it in this way. So it's like a vector, you can use a vector and matrix to in order to write down the regression model for the multivariate case. So the least squared approach, in this case, the least squared approach is trying to find the beta, the vector here, you have to be careful, the beta here is a vector, p plus one dimensional vector. It's trying to find this beta such that the L2 norm of this vector, the response minus this guy, is minimized. So it's then you can just even, in this case, you know, it's an L2 norm and square of the L2 norm of the vector. So you can even write this, this transpose itself. Then by taking the derivative with respect to each beta, you can even find that it has this beautiful closed form solution to the linear regression. So it's just x transpose x and take the inverse of this matrix times x transpose y. This will be your closed form solution to your fitting aspect. So this, and there are even a lot of good news, just like in the univariate case, the this way estimator, like your estimated result, is roughly normally distributed cent centered at the true parameter. And with this noise, the noise here will be a matrix, it's a, like a noise matrix, but at least everything is given is depending on your observation. And you can estimate this, of course you can estimate this guy, the sigma squared is again the noise level, you can estimate that. So then you can use that to a confidence interval for the entire beta. So come on, we are using like the R or some other software you will find that they will automatically count. Even if you have multiple covariates, you will automatically construct the confidence interval for each of them. Because here you can see we have a closed form solution to that kind of problem. So solving this, finding the confidence interval is actually very easy. As long as the P is not very, very large. When the P is very large, then there could be a lot of problems. Especially when the P is larger than N, this inverse will not exist. You, you, the reason is that this guy will give you a rank division matrix. So the inverse will not exist when the, when the number of covariates is greater than the sample size. So in that case, there are some other approach to handle that. And I think we don't have time, but if you are interested in that kind of problem, you can search the high dimensional statistics. So high dimensional statistics and higher model and a big field that trying to understand what have, how to do this estimation when the sample size P, uh, when the sample size N is less than the number of cover, covariate P or much less than that. There's a couple of really nice theorems, and I think nowadays that this is 80% of the paper about high dimensional statistics. It's a very popular field in statistics now. Here are some remarks on the linear regression. So linear regression is an important topic. And but due to the time constraint, we cannot talk much of, a lot about the details. But if you are interested in you can just search it. ANOVA, R square, outliers, and various points. There are some other qualities related to the linear model and has been studied a lot. 
and so you can actually can search these terms. And the least squared approach is a generic, is a generic approach. Now it can be not only applied to finding a linear estimator, it can be applied to finding a lot of different kind of estimator. Like if I'm trying to model a like a regression function in a unary case, if I try to model it as this completely complicated function, I can still apply the least square method to estimate it. So this is a generic method, you can apply it to many, many different problems. This is a very powerful tool. That's a linear regression. Any questions before we move to the next topic, which is the logistic regression? So uh, there's another linear regression method is that we minimize the distance to the line, to the yeah. yeah. regression line. So then you, the, main, the method you mentioned is to minimize the estimate y to the function's y. So what's the difference between that? So um, that's a very good point. So minimize the distance to the regression line. Um, you mean like in the xy plane, you minimize the direct distance? I think that method will be related to PCA, principal component method, if I remember correctly, but I'm not very sure. And sometimes people will use another way. Instead of minimize the square this square like y i minus the predicted value, some people will just use absolute value. So in the case of absolute, if you are minimize absolute value, then it's called a robust linear regression. Because it's not is that method will be more robust to say if I have some outliers in my data. And then the fitting line, if there's no outlier, is very close to like a least square estimate, but it's more robust to this outlier because we are minimizing this. L1, so called L1 distance. And it turns out that the reason why minimizing L1 distance is, the, is more robust is that if you try, if I actually have a bunch of points, and I'm trying to find a point that minimizes the summation of L, the absolute distance from everybody to this point, the optimal point will be the median. And if you are optimizing in terms of the square distance, then the optimal point, the optimal point will be the mean point, the mean. So you know the median is typically more robust compared to against the outlier because if you have a very large population, the location of the median will typically will not change. But the mean will be affected a lot. That's why sometimes we will use like a, optimizing this L1 distance, like a, just taking the absolute value distance. So I think, in fact, the reason why people minimize the distance is assuming errors in both x and y. Yeah. Right? And if the errors are the same x and y, then you write down the Gaussian model that you're using and discover that to be the optimal. So it's a different problem. It's actually not a regression problem. Yeah, I think that in that case it's not a regression problem. It's more like trying to find a line that passes in most of so it's more like sometimes people call it like principal line or principal, sometimes people even call it principal curve if you allow it to be a curve, passing most of the point and then try to fit that. Very good point, yeah. So that's in the case of if you have so here you, you have you may notice that in the regression model, we do not assume any like we do not assume any uncertainty on the value of the covariate. So we assume that the value x is Major without any noise. So that's the assumption of that. So if you are measuring the covariate with noise, then you have to be very, very careful. And it's ordinary regression method is typically does not work. Okay. So now let's move on to the next topic, which is the logistic regression. So here's a very special case. So it may some special case. The result of variable y may only take two possible values, zero and one. So in this case, it's like, like you know, it's like, it's like if I'm trying to do regression, but now the y response variable would be interpreted as like whether it's, a, it's an indicator of a certain state, like whether an observed star is a certain type of star or it's not a certain type of star, like the galaxy is a red galaxy or not. So then I can use the response. The response variable will just be an indicator indicating whether it's one means that it's not in that category, zero means that it's not in that category. So actually, this type of logistic regression has been widely applied to medical research. Because you know, when there's an individual, then you can always classify them into patient, like a, like individual with disease or not. So it's like a zero and one. So in the case, spatial case, why is not taking this only two possible values, zero and one? Then you can see like, if what I'm trying to be a regression model, it might, it might give you like a this simple linear regression, then it might give you some very strange result. Because in this case, the, re the re regression function Rx, is ex remember it's expected value of y given covariate x. So in this case, it turns out that it will be the probability that y response is 1 given x being x. 
make a covariance located at point x. So it, it turns out that it's a probability. So if you fit a linear regression, simple linear regression, you will find that you will summarize them, you will have a fitted probability greater than one, or a fitted probability less than zero. In both cases, it does not make any sense, right? Just what's the meaning of a probability, neg a negative probability? So the logistic regression is, an, at least to me, there are many ways to interpret that. At least to me, is that it's a kind of a smart way to remodel it to, to, we want to fit, again, we want to fit a linear model, but we want to do some modification or like transformation on this regression function so that we can still, put the linear fit is reasonable. So what we are going to do is that, just observing this regression function, because it's a probability, it's a number between zero and one. And when the probability is half, it means that the chance of y being one and zero is, is a, like the equal, it has equal probability. But the half is now centered at, this kind of equal probability is centered at one half, like it's centered at half, which is not that ideal for fitting a linear model. So what we will first consider is to use, consider, do a transformation to find the odds. So odds O x is a regression function divided by one plus a regression function. Why do we want to do this one? Because then you can interpret this number as probability that y equal to one versus probability of y equal to zero. So it's like the odds between these two probabilities. And then this odds is still not a really nice guy because it's taking value between zero and infinity. Right? And when the two chances are the same, it's centered at one. So it's like making zero to one versus one to infinity. It's still not a really good one. So now let's do another transformation taking a long probability. So let's take the log of the odds, which is this guy, so log of odds. So now we get this function, let's call Lx, which is a nice one, because it's from negative infinity to the positive infinity. And at least two probability are the same, it's centered at zero. So in this case, well, this number seems to be a good one to model, to, to, to model it as a linear function. So the logistic regression, basically the idea is that instead of modeling a regression function as a linear function, Let's model it as this log as a linear function. So when you model this log as a linear function, it turns out that this guy leads to this form of the regression function. So the regression function i can be written as this one. And if I remember correctly, this is also related to the Boltzmann distribution, and some, there are some things that you're talking about how this is related to the Boltzmann distribution. But now that's why you will see like in the logistic regression why people always want to model it, right? It is form. So this form is not coming from nowhere. It's actually some intuition we try to obtain a symmetric result. And we also want to fit the linear model because linear model is easy to interpret. So that's why in the logistic regression we will fit this guy. And so this is the regression function. And in practice, when we observe the value of y, y1, y x1, y2, x2, blah, 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 how do we really estimate this parameter? So here again, the parameters are beta 0 and beta 1. How do we estimate the parameter? Is again, we can do it by the MLE. That's what the people were doing by MLE. Then, but the problem is that the MLE does not have a closed form solution. But there are some, then you can find the solution by the numerical method. And if I remember correctly, this is a convex problem. So the, solu the solution is guaranteed to be optimal. So you, you, you can just do the numerical method. There are numerical methods that will directly give you the optimal value. Although it does not have a closed form solution, but the solution is unique and it's easy to, up easy to find. So that's why a lot of packages, if you apply for log distribution, they can kind of efficiently compute the result. So that's the logistic regression. So for this spatial case, when you have a zero and one, that's how people will kind of find the estimator, and how people will model the result. So, any, so far, any questions on logistic regression? And sometimes people will use logistic regression to interpret that as a so-called classification problem. Because it's zero and one, you can view that as like making class decision based on like if I have an observation located at x, what should be the class level? It should be zero or one. So then, because here we get the probability, so a simple approach is that I always pick the one with the higher chance. So then you can convert this from this regression to do classification properly. So okay, so all the previous method is assuming that the regression function can be written in certain parameter form again, right? So it's like we always see this beta zero, beta one, these parameters are determining something that we want to estimate. 
And well, you know, in some cases, the regression function Rx could be very complicated. It may not admit any parameter form. So in that case, if you try to use the parameter model, maybe you know we, are, we might suffer a lot from this kind of problem. So there's an alternative approach which is called a number of regression. It's just like a number as the estimation. We do not make any parameter assumption on like the form of the regression function, but we can directly estimate it. We can directly estimate it from the data. That's called a per number of regression. So here we're going to talk about three methods. Regression from or sometimes people call it binning method. The kernel regression and spline approach. If we have time, we'll call, talk a little bit about spline approach. So we, uh, here's an example that if I have a data like this is covariate, it's a response. So you can see it's like a waveform. But if now this red line, if you're trying to nicely fit a linear regression, you see that you are not getting a really good result. This is this line is the linear fit, but it does not really represent the structure. So we want to have some other approach that can allow us to capture this, like, like the oscillating structure. So regress graph. And I find a very interesting thing is that the regress from very few people know its net, but I think most of the people are using it. In if you check, I think 80% of the paper when people are talking about regression, people are doing this guy. So it's it's the method of binning. So the reason why it's called regression, I think it's called is from the regression plus his graph. So what we do is that the idea is that we bin the range of the covariate covariate. We bin the range of the covariate into several bins. And then for the value within each bin, we just use the average of the response within each bin. So that's why it's called, like, it's just like a histogram, but it's applied to a regression problem. So what you sometimes see is like in this case, I will estimate like this, 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 this will be my estimator. And how I get that is that I think the entire range is at least one, two, three, four, five, six bins. So for each bin, like update in this, so I first use Covariate, I bin the range of the covariate. And for observation in the same bin, I'm using the average of their response variable. So that's how I get this estimate. This value is just average, average of all of that, average of all of that, blah, blah, blah. So that's how I could get this estimate. And of course, just like this graph, you can see like if I have more observation, then I can choose a bin that's like a, that's a shorter, I can choose a shorter bin to balance the bias and variance trade off. But this is like the idea of the reverse one. So the reverse one, I think many of you have applied just this binning approach. But just somehow I don't know why people, why this, many people don't, don't know its net, but it has this, it has a real net of that. And sometimes you in the paper you may see a picture like this guy. Uh, we have a covariate here and another a response variable in the y-axis, and you see people having this one. Actually, this is somewhat like a from a reverse one. So it's just like what we have talked about within the range, take the average, and we can even compute it, the size of the error. So it's like a, sometimes we call it error bar, so it's like one sigma error bar in this case. Well, like, you know, one sigma error bar is always interpreted as in terms of the confidence interval, but it's more like 68% if you assume Gaussian noise. So this is like a real example of the regress graph in, in some paper. So that's a regress graph. So there's another approach to, to do this number regression, which is by it's very similar to a kernel density estimator, it's called a kernel regression. So the kernel regression is a regression estimator say for the point x. How I estimate this the regression value is that I'm taking the weighted average of all the response. So this weighted average depends on the location of x. And this weight function has a least form. So the k here and all these things, the same as the kernel density estimator. So what, and sometimes actually, if you are reading in statistical literature, people will typically write in this way, and then they will write in this way. But I think sometimes looking from this way is more intuitive. Because what here, what we are doing here is that, I think the next slide, I think, yeah. This wave function, it has a property that if you check the numerator, denominator and the numerator, summation of wix, for each x, summation of each i is one and each wix is greater or equal to zero, which means that it's a weight. So it's essentially this, this estimator is a weight average. So it means that for points that are close, say if I want to predict the regression function at the point x, 
Then I just take the weight average of all the response and the way that if the an observation whose covariate is close to point X, I give it more weight. And for points that are away from that, I give it less weight. So that's the interpretation of this kernel regression. Although there are other ways that you can view that as like first estimate a density function, kernel density estimator, and then you convert that into a conditional density function, and then use the definition of the regression function, you can get this is the same result. But I would prefer to interpret that as a weight average. So now you know that the kernel function determines how the weight is given. If you're using a Gaussian kernel, it means that the Gaussian weight is like, you're giving a weight on this kind of Gaussian tail. So away from that, then the decreasing pattern is like a Gaussian. If you're using a so-called uniform or spherical kernel, it means that only the points within the distance edge will be considered. Every point outside that, if you remember, uniform kernel is like outside is zero. So it means that the points of, away from the distance edge will be given no weight. So again, this edge, just like a kernel based estimator, is the smoothing bandwidth, and it determines the amount of smoothing we are trying to apply to when we are trying to do this smoothing. That's the idea of this kernel regression. So you can always view that as this weighted average. So now the kernel function and the smoothing bandwidth determines how the weight is given. And again, over the smoothing bandwidth has more plays a key role compared to the kernel, kernel function. The kernel function typically will not be that, have less strong effect, but the smoothing value is edge. Open it gives a lot of, it, it affects a lot on the result. So here's an example, like I have smoothing value, is like the green one is like smoothing value is large. You can see like, again, it's deviated from the kind of the pattern because we are over smoothing over the bias is large, just like the kernel based estimator. But edge is large, it means that we're smoothing out more points. But it typically gives you a more stable result. And when the edge is like 0.9, it gives you a quite nice fit, the purple one. And the orange one is like when the smoothing bandwidth is very small. You can see we fit a kind of wiggly structure. Sometimes both call this phenomena like under smoothing when the smoothing bandwidth is too, large, too small. And the call this guy like when the smoothing bandwidth is too large, call it over smoothing. It's just some terminology that people would use. So how do we, well you know, now the smoothing bandwidth edge plays a key role in this estimation. So in practice, how do we choose that? So this, in the regression case, there's a simple approach. Like in the density estimation case, it's still an unsolved problem, although there are some methods that people use. But in the regression case, people prefer to use this method called the cross validation. It's a very nice approach to choose the bandwidth. The idea of cross validation is that we try to choose the smoothing bandwidth to optimize the predic prediction accuracy. So what is the prediction accuracy? It's for an estimate, regression estimate and half. The prediction accuracy is typically like we typically use this guy, but there are other ways you can choose. So we use the expected distance of observing a new pair of x, y, and plugging into our estimator and taking a square error of that. So it's like predicting a future observation. So if now I'm, I have an estimator, what's the app on average? What's the prediction, prediction accuracy for a new future observation? And in terms of the kernel regression, you know, edge, the smoothing value with edge determines will affect your prediction accuracy. So we typically require as R edge. It will become a function of the smoothing value. And what we want to choose is that we want to choose the smoothing value that optimizes this that minimize this predict, uh, like optimize the prediction, prediction accuracy. So this is more like a prediction error rather than accuracy, but we want to optimize that. So that's the idea. We have, for the future observation, we want to optimize that. And there's a simple interpretation for that because we want to optimize for the future outcome. We want to choose a smoothing bandwidth that optimize the future outcome. So, but the problem here is that this quantity, the predict, prediction error or prediction accuracy is an unknown quantity to us. Because there are two, there are six expectations, so it's an unknown quantity. And you also have to be very careful about this expectation because they are, it involves expectation for two guys. The first one is that the expectation for your estimator. And the second expectation is for the future outcome. So there are these two parts of the expectation. So what people would do is that well, there's a simple law. If 
whenever you insert this if whenever you see exponential of something, what people will generally do is that, well, a simple way to estimate the exponential of something is take the sample average. So what people do is that, now it's, we, like, we split the data into two parts. We, I use the first part of the, of the data to estimate this guy. Then I use the second part of the data to evaluate the, to, I would add that the second part of the data is not used in the constructing my estimator, but I just use the second part of the data to evaluate the accuracy. Use the second part of the data because it's not used in the first part, so it behaves like a future outcome, right, for our my estimator. So that's the idea, of the original idea of the cross validation, and this method is called a data splitting. I split the data into two parts. Use the first part to control my estimator, use the second part to evaluate my accuracy. And the cross validation is a modification method from this data splitting. So the idea is that we are going to do this procedure for multiple times. So I think, yeah, I think that's like basically the idea is that we will we will split our original data set into multiple sub subsets and we will treat part of them. Typically we will split them into two parts. One part is called a training set. The part of the data we use to control our estimator. The other part is called a validation set. The part of the data we are going to evaluate for prediction accuracy. So we, are, we will split data into two parts. And typically what we do is that we will partition the entire data set into several sub, sub, sub data and then we use one subset as the validation set and all the others as the training set. And then we can, after, after doing so, we estimate the result and then plug it into the validation set, we can evaluate the prediction accuracy. Then we move to the next one, then we just swap the validation set to another subset of the data and treat the others as training set again and repeat the same process again and again and again. And have the average. So I think it's better to use it in terms of this picture, to illustrate that in this picture. So it's like a, Sometimes if we split data into K4, we will K subset, we will K call it K4 cross validation. So in terms of here is an illustration for the so-called five-fold cross validation. Or sometimes you, people, people will just write five four C D. So what we are doing here is that here is the original data. Now given the original data, we randomly commute them and randomly split them into five subsets. Data one, data two, data three, four, five. So we randomly we permute them and randomly split them into five different subsets. Now we pick the first subset as the validation set. So also the blue one is the validation set, and all the others as the training set. So we use all the others to control our estimator. So this estimator is constructed using all these four subsets of the data. Then we plug it into the first validation set to evaluate the prediction accuracy or predict prediction error, RH hat one. So this is the first guy. Then we move on, we change the validation set to the second subset of the data and view all others as the training set. Again, we use them to control the estimator, use this guy to evaluate the prediction accuracy. Now we do this procedure for each of them. Like I will get five numbers of this prediction accuracy. Then I take the average of them as an estimator of the prediction accuracy, the total estimator of the prediction accuracy. But in practice, we will not only do it once. After computing the final list average, I will repeat the entire process again, again, and again. Because, you know, sometimes you, your evaluation may depend on which subset of the data you are picking, how you split the data. So when we, when we compute this number, we will repeat again, repeat it and compute another, this number again, and then do it multiple, multiple, multiple times, and take the final average. So that like the randomness, will, we want to minimize this kind of randomness. And then we'll get an estimate of this prediction accuracy or the prediction risk. Then we will typically, and then we will for each smoothing band with H, like all any Turing parameter. Then we will just do it each by each by each. So we will plot a, some something like this picture. So the x-axis is a smoothing band width, the y-axis is the five-fold cross validation error. And so in many cases you will see a picture like this guy. So apparently. How should we choose a smoothing bandwidth? Well, we should just choose it around this area because it is the one that minimizes the cross validation error. So that's the idea of the cross validation. So, and a very important thing is that it's, cross validation is typically used to either to evaluate your 
prediction accuracy, or is typically used to choose this kind of so-called Turing parameters? Yes. Excuse me. If we if we choose four fold or three fold, the result is the same. The result. That's a good point. Result will typically be different if you are choosing slightly different if you are choosing different fold. But somehow, and that's a, I think that's still an open question. It turns out that five fold or ten fold always works quite well, and there's no. No theory to explain why. I just like in practice, people always use like five or ten. I think ten is the most commonly used. But I think there's no theory. We will have some rough idea about why, but not really a good theory, theoretical reason about why we should choose that. But typically, we will choose like a ten or five fold. Because the reason is that when we're evaluating the prediction accuracy, this guy, this guy, ideally we want and have this guy to be as close to our original estimate as possible, right? But because we cannot use all the data points, because we need some part of to be the validation set. So we need to trade off. So we want this guy to use as many data points as possible. So when you are using a like tenfold, then basically we we'll use 90% of the data for the training set, 10% for the validation set. So that's close to our original estimate. And the validation set, you also you also want it to be sufficiently large so that you know you get a stable estimate. And of course, there are some extreme cases, both toys and all CV, they want our cross validation. Which means that in that case, the size of the validation set is content only single observation. I just leave that out and <laughs> use all the others. And the good news for that is that for some cases, there's a cross form solution. Because in that case, you know, you can do a lot of calculation, there's no much computation. Because when you have two points, then you have C and choose two. It's a lot of combination, but when you only have one, you only have M of base and cases. So people even for some estimate this kind of more solution. But you know, ten for some like people always choose like ten fold or five fold cross validation. Very good point. Yes. How how do you stress uh, the kernel function? You mean the cow we choose the kernel function? Yeah. That's actually a, also a good point. I think sometimes you can choose the Gaussian or some compact kernel or some smooth compact kernel. Right, that's a very good point. And I think actually you can do the same thing using cross validation. But now it's just like this R H is not only a function of H, but also the function of the kernel which you are considering. So you can write it R H K. So basically, what you would do is that what you would get is like this picture. But say if you consider three different kernel functions, then it would be three curve. And then you can just choose the one that has the you know minimal minimal error. Then that should be that can be a way you can choose the kernel function. But typically, the kernel function will not affect us that much as the smoothing bandwidth. Very good, very good point. Okay, so that's the idea of cross validation. And why do we want to use? Why do we want to use? Why do we? You know, for some people, they will say that, well, why not? Why do I have to do this split? Why do not like? I just use all the data point and then use the, all the same data point to evaluate my prediction accuracy. And from a theoretical point of view, we would say that that method leads to a biased estimate of the prediction accuracy. And sometimes people will call that method like overfitting because you are kind of fitting something that is, you know, using a data point or you are fitting a too complicated model. So it gives you a too optimistic result. So just let's just consider a very extreme case in the kernel regression. When the smoothing bandwidth, and you use the data twice, use the data to estimate your regression function and to evaluate your prediction result. So H is very, very close to zero. Say if you are, if you say let's use a three fold kernel, then assuming that every point you only contain one observation, everything because three fold kernel you only weight it by itself. It turns out that in this case, your accuracy is 100% because you pass every point. Right? In that case, in this extreme case, it does not imply that you are really fitting to the real function. Because you are kind of fitting too much to the data. That's called overfitting, so that that's the problem of the bias as risk estimate. So that will, that's why we need to split the data into two parts. You just you have to avoid using the data twice for estimation and evaluating your result. So sometimes people will call this validation error or cross validation error because it's a more reliable estimate of your of your result. Just remember, you always have to do this splitting the data. Otherwise, you might sometimes you might get a too optimistic result. So um, by, by the way, there's an opposite case, it's called underfitting. It means that when we are fitting a too naive model, like when we are using a linear regression to fit into this sinusoidal data set, then that's called underfitting because the, our model is too simple, it's a linear function, it cannot capture this complicated structure. So that would be called uh, underfitting. 
as up as this. Sometimes we feel that very complicated modeling past every point is called up overfitting. It's not really estimating the result correctly. So yeah, I think I only have a couple of times. So I just want to summarize the result by the next method is called a spline. So it's a very, very it's a method belong to a family of method called penalized regression method. So what it what it do is that we're trying to find the function f such that yi, this is the observed value of the response, minus my predictive value fxi, this is like a predictive value of my using my regression function, using this f, the predictive value of this fitting to the data, I want to optimize this guy, plus a penalization on the smoothness, smoothness of the regression function. It's like, I want to, this part means that, yeah, next slide, I have a nice interpretation, this part represents the fitting to the data. I want to find a fun regression function such that it fits the data very well. And I also want to make sure this function is smooth. Because you know, if I have n points, I can always, no matter how many points you have, you can always fit a very weak function to pass every point. So this guy is called smoothness penalty. So it means that I cannot fit the data that is changing too quickly. Otherwise, this part will be wrong. So this, when we are trying to find this, the spline approach is trying to find such a function such that we optimize this too. And in many, many regression problems, especially when you have either high dimensional data, as I have mentioned, or when you are doing this number of method, sometimes people will always have this, this square part, like square part, square error are fitting to the data, plus some pain, penalty term on your model. And sometimes some people even, penalty term is also related to like model selection, so you want to choose the one, the model, that optimize, that fit the data well, and also avoid the data being, the, the model being too complicated. That's the idea of this line. And so again, this, this lambda is a Turing parameter. It determines how we want to smooth out and how do we want to put the penalty on the smoothness. So a larger lambda, it means that the function will be more smooth. A smaller lambda is implies the function will be more less smooth. So this is like an example in R, but basically you can see like, if I choose the smoothness, the lambda here in R is called, it's a component called SPAR. If I choose it to be quite nice, then it will fit to this purple curve. If I choose it to be too large, it fits it too, too small, so it becomes just, a, just like a linear regression. But if this number is too small, then you can see like a small wiggle structure. That's a spline. And I think that's all of it. So that's all of the talk on the regression. And thank you. Pre-estimate that in advance. 
But let's, yeah, there's a couple of methods, like adaptive methods, like a loop. Some, I think one method is called a balloon estimator. The other, I cannot remember the detail, but it's called log, like adaptive smoothing methods, like adaptive smoothing methods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh,